Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 66, For the Kids, Windsor Extra Life 2019. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, this past weekend was our big, giant, extra-life charity gaming marathon. Due to this, we are going to swap things up a bit this week, because there is a lot to cover with Extra Life. Sponsors to thank, how much money we raised, how it went, and all the games we played, and there are a lot. So basically, we're going to mash the Ask Your Bellhop segment with the Bellhop's Tabletop segment, because the question we're answering is, how did Extra Life go? The other thing we do have is we have one more thing for you tonight, something all three of us played, and that is going to be a review of the latest Eric Lang and Rob Davio game, Cthulhu, Death May Die. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. First up, Humperdinck2089 uh, 289 said, Thanks for showing us the game. This is on uh, the review on our uh, unboxing, yeah, unboxing for the Cthulhu, yeah, Cthulhu. Cthulhu Death May Die. Thanks for showing us the game. Just a little criticism to better your channel. Maybe brush up a bit on the game before you start filming. That way you don't run into issues like to, like knowing whether or not to show things that spoil. Also, just knowing what uh, things are and used for. Because at this point, what you're doing isn't much different than listing off components with a personal opinion on how cool it looks. Knowing yeah, things... Stop right there. Yeah. Isn't that an unboxing? I, like, like, I, I thought so. Listing the components off and a personal opinion on how cool they look. That's that, that's that, pretty much every uh, every phone it? unboxing I've ever watched. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, knowing things like the optional adding for the game was one of the biggest miniatures ever put into a board game, a Mega Cthulhu mini that is the size of a small child and that actually acts as part of the game board. Just had to say that when you seemed unimpressed by the standard Cthulhu mini in the base game, lol. But remember, <laughs> it's just an opinion about what would make your better video better for the future. Okay, first off, uh, besides the fact that I don't quite understand what you were looking for in an unboxing video, if it wasn't a list of components and what I thought of them, uh, the Big Cthulhu. I wasn't going to talk about that because I was unboxing the retail version, and that doesn't come in the retail version. So sure, maybe I could have mentioned that. Fair enough. Now, I do admit I totally take full criticism my fault. I should have done a bit of research. I saw the cover of the box. I saw it was Rob Davio. Rob Davio is the legacy master, the person who made Pandemic Legacy, who made Risk Legacy. And when I saw a bunch of boxes, I got scared. I'm like, oh, shoot, maybe I'm not supposed to open these. So, yes, I should have at least done that bit of research. I should have realized whether this was or was not a, not a game. So you got me there. I totally agree on that. As for listening off the components, if you're going to watch my unboxing videos, that's what I'm going to do, because to me, that's what an unboxing video is. And as for the giant three-foot miniature, well, awesome. It doesn't come in the retail box, so I didn't want to give people to start talking about stuff they can't have. Because, man, shipping that to the retail stores would be <laughs> a pain. Wow. Or even just producing it in mass quantities, I think. like that. The thing was three and a half feet tall. Like, I got to admit, it's cool, it's awesome, but that didn't come in the box I opened. Absolutely. All right, up next, also a shorter comment on our Cthulhu Death May Die unboxing, which actually at this point is our second most popular video. So thanks, Stolen, for giving me a chance to open that box. Uh, this is from Tulio Manning, who said, thanks. Will you make a playthrough video? Well, we have one, and it'll be live tomorrow at 3 in the afternoon. You can catch it then. Yeah, as long as I can get on there and get the description in there before <laughs> then, which shouldn't be a problem. All right, one of the changes we made over the last couple of weeks, and I haven't heard anything on it, so I have to assume no news is good news, is we stopped breaking out the Bellhop's Tabletop segment from the main podcast when releasing videos on YouTube. They just weren't getting the views. Like, they literally, like, ones from months ago still only had 10, 20 views. Um, I posted online in a few different places, Twitter, Facebook, MeWeed, saying, hey, does anyone miss this? 
I only did get one comment, and that was from patron Yuho Rutila. He wrote, I have to say I don't watch podcasts from YouTube as they work just fine straight to my ears, plus show notes if needed. And you are doing a fine job producing audio-only compatible material. Thank you for that. Well, thank you, Yuho. Uh, we try, and I, uh, I know I've been pretty happy with the uh, audio content we've been putting out, so I'm glad it's being appreciated. Well, that's it for this week's comments. And thank you to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. Uh, not too much talk already, although we are have been talking about a, a slight little addition that Twitch has allowed us. Uh, where mm -hmm. we are actually able to run some ads during the show. Uh, we're going to try and keep it minimal. We don't want to drive off people, but it's nice to have a little bit of income. And when we do run an ad, that means when you join the show, you're not getting a pre-roll ad. So it's a bonus for you as well. Yeah, it's, it makes us a bit of money, and we can run 30-second ads. And like Sean and I were talking about, we liked about the middle of the show. Both of us tend to run out of coffee. So we're thinking it might be a nice point where we can throw in, you know, one minute of ads while we each go refill our cups and then come back. And like I said, it stops people when you first get to Twitch, and I know it annoys the heck out of me, is when I first go to watch someone and the show starts at 9, and those shows that start right away. And this is a tip for anyone who streams on Twitch. Don't show, start your show right when you say you start your show, because almost everyone who gets there is going to have to sit through whatever the hottest, latest video game is. I know it was Borderlands 3 for an awful long time. Um, this way, the pre-roll by throwing ads during the show, it gets rid of that. Uh, ads run during the show also pay slightly better. Plus, what's 30 seconds? What's a minute, right? Sit through that. We got to take a break anyway. It gives a chance for people to do whatever they need to do in the middle of the show. And as Dee pointed out, uh, they do not show up in the YouTube content. Uh, that would cause yeah. all sorts of problems if we were to bring ads over into YouTube from Twitch. Uh, so the yeah. YouTube content will be free of any ads. And I'll probably just edit out any blathering well, we do during the uh, content, during that content. YouTube content will be free of any ads we put in. YouTube still might no. interrupt in the middle of your video that is and true. show you ads. That's nothing to do right. with us. And no, we get nothing from that. So not a penny. Not a penny. Not a penny. Yep. Tell your friends to subscribe to us on YouTube and maybe we can start making pennies off every ad. Absolutely. 1,000 uh, 1, viewers and we should 1, be 1,000 subscribers. 1,000 subscribers and we should be able to pull it off because our views are actually ramp ramping up rather quickly. The, yep. the views don't scare us, but we do need 1,000 subscribers for that uh, yeah. next status on YouTube. If you've got a thousand friends with nothing better to do, <laughs> tell them to head over to our channel and hit uh, the, the... Technically, we only button. need about 800. We don't even need well, a full true. thousand now. Yeah, but I'll take a thousand. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll take a hey, thousand. Hey, Danielle, how you doing? All righty. Uh, so we'll be back checking the lobby a few more times during the show. <clears throat> Up next... The Bellhop's initial thoughts on Cthulhu Death May Die from Simon. Actually, I think Sean will have some thoughts on this one too, since he played it too. Uh, Cthulhu Death May Die is a new cooperative board game by Rob Davio and Eric M. Lang. These are two names that if you are a board game enthusiast, you should recognize. Rob Davio is the godfather of uh, legacy games, and Eric M. Lang is the godfather of awesome looking miniatures on a map type games I bait, I would basically call it. Uh, it blew up on Kickstarter last year. Uh, it featured the largest miniature ever produced for a board game, which we already kind of talked about in the last segment. Uh, this miniature is so big that it is the board that you move your miniatures on. I gotta admit, it is amazing. The retail vision version just hit stores November 1st. So, you know, anyone who complains, we don't talk about the new hotness. Here's us proving you wrong. Uh, the retail version is what we're going to be talking about today. I don't have any three-foot-tall Cthulhu. If I did, it'd be in the backdrop right there. Uh, now, I do have to send out a shout-out to Solon from Tabletop Renaissance, Windsor's newest game store. Uh, he was awesome enough to give me a copy of this game to review, and mainly to drum up local interest in the game. No other compensation was provided. So this was uh, a Kickstarter this past summer. They made $2.4 million on this Kickstarter. Uh, and, uh, and things have just, uh, I think some backers received their game a little bit before, uh, the end of, uh, October, depending on, you know, depending on where you are and who you are. Uh, but even most of those didn't, uh. Yeah, I gotta admit, it depends on what you ordered. I think yeah. if you just got the retail box, you probably got the retail box. 
if you got the add-ons, you probably haven't gotten your game yet. I know a lot of people, since I've been tweeting out about this game a lot recently, have been saying, can't wait to get my copy, can't wait to get my copy. And I've been really happy. I haven't seen anyone going, damn it, how do you have a copy and I don't? So it must be well communicated. Yeah. I did not back it. Um, I, re I do remember it took me a bit until, like, it was after I did the unboxing. I actually remembered seeing the Kickstarter and deciding not to not to back it. Yeah. So you can check out the unboxing video of this on our YouTube channel, and it has been quite popular. Yes. Uh, it's breaking in the views almost as fast as the Gloomhaven FAQ, and at this rate, it may even end up passing that if it stays yeah. popular. This is the, the, I don't know, I think it's a combination of Sean did a bit more work on the post on it, plus I did a new format for unboxing videos, which you'll see in the coming weeks. Uh, not this Monday's, because this Monday's was recorded a while ago. But all our new unboxing videos, I went for another angle where we can show off the product a lot better, I think. And I think that helps, because we do get to show off all the miniatures, plus this game's hot. Absolutely. So we're going to start off talking about the production quality. Uh, this is why we're talking about the unboxing video. Like, really, you got to see this uh, or see it in person. If you can see it in person to get the full effect, this is one of the best looking games I've seen. Like, everyone knows Kuhlman or Not games look great and come with great miniatures, but these are over the top, even for Kuhlman or Not. Like, the detail and the posing. Like, they have done stuff that I know back in the day you couldn't do with molds. So I don't know how they were able to get them at these angles and stuff, but, like, you even get little tentacle miniatures for tracking your stats instead of wooden cubes. It's just over-the-top miniatures. Yeah. Now, not only are the minis great, and one of the things we were noticing uh, was things like fabric. Uh, the yeah. the fabric is so detailed that all you need, all it really needs is a quick wash, and the detail in that fabric will just pop on cloaks and things like that. Uh, but as well as the minis as expected, the cardboard is nice and solid, mm -hmm. and of course, the character art is right up there with a lot of what they're putting out lately. So you've got some really nice looking art for all your characters and on the boxes yeah, and, and agreed. whatnot. I, 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 a props to the art that I didn't have in the original review when I wrote this is um, appropriately dressed characters. We'll put it that way. There's there's no cheesecake beefcake here. It's it's everything looks realistic. It's probably the wrong term for a Cthulhu game. <laughs> True. But, but it's, it's Reasonable. not that overly, yeah. yes. Reasonably dressed. dressed. Yeah. They, they aren't they aren't I, flaunting body parts as they're about yeah. to wade into battle, which I thought was really impressive for yep. <laughs> even for an Eric Lang game to be honest. <laughs> uh, now, besides the minis, the game also comes with some of the best looking map tiles I've seen. Like these are really nice map tiles, and I got to note they're different than Mansions of Madness because they're similar style. It's a similar theme. You're doing insides of buildings as well as corridors and and chambers and hallways and stuff like that. Um, there's counters to punch out. Everything's well cut, good quality. Everything's really nice looking. Now, this is where we're going to end up talking about some of our first problems with the game. Because I will say, there's no question that these are beautiful tiles. The, the maps look gorgeous. It's really yeah. easy to see where doors are. Uh, laying them out was easy and quick. As soon, you know, you look at the, map, that the scenario map and it lays it out. That's great. And then you try to put things on them. And that's where the first real problem of this game, I think, comes out. Um, you're dealing with Cthulhu and greater demons and things that are big, nasty monsters. Well, big, nasty monsters and small, beautiful rooms don't really match. Uh, and so we'll get a, more into that a little, a little later. But the, uh, as beautiful as they are, they didn't think through their sizing maybe 100%. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be getting to that one later. I saved my final thoughts for after I talk about everything, but that is is also one of my complaints. Now, the rule book's nice, glossy, full color, filled with artwork and examples. Uh, I got to say, it's really easy to read, and there is an example for every action in the game. So, like, literally, like, here's a thing, here's an example, here's a thing, here's an example. No complaints there at all. Yeah, I mean, you, you unboxed it on Thursday. We played it Friday night, mm -hmm. um, and none of us read the rule book, just you. And we didn't really have any questions or concerns. I mean, the yeah, game I don't, I don't played... even remember having to grab the book like more than once or twice, and it was for really odd edge the things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the game. Do it. You know, I mean, yes, Mo can teach games well, but the fact of the matter is, you still usually have to refer to the book because mm -hmm. it's just so much. No, the game played really well. Yeah. Uh, then in the box, you have a bunch more boxes. Uh, there's the Rob Davio influence. The base game comes with six scenario boxes. These are individual little boxes that are in there. Uh, if you played Gloomhaven, it kind of looks like the different character packs. And then two giant Elder God boxes. The scenario boxes, when you open them up, have a bunch of cards and the stuff needed to set up each scenario. Uh, this can include more punch boards. 
in tokens. I don't know if they all do. We only opened up a couple of them. Elder God box represents your main baddie, who you want to fight. Base box gives you Cthulhu and he who shall not be named. The Elder God box also comes with more cards and punch outs and, of course, some really kick-ass minis. Uh, the Cthulhu one comes with two miniatures, Cthulhu and a star sign, and the other one comes with, it looks like a priestess and he who shall not be named himself. The first one, not the modern Voldernut, who he, that Voldernut totally stole someone else's stick there. <laughs> Um, all this fits great into the box, um, better than most cool mini or not games, I gotta admit. Uh, there's a place for everything, except for the room tiles, those just kind of nest on top. Uh, the game even includes a card that shows you where to put the minis. Thank you very much for that cool mini. That is something I wish they'd done in, say, Rising Sun, because every time I go to clan up Rising Sun, it's a matter of, does this guy fit here? No, does he fit here? Uh, as for just what you get in the box, I was blown away. I th This was really impressive present just from looking at what you get now i think when it comes to the packaging it absolutely the only complaint we had was there's one set of cards that slips around and wasn't really well secured um and i think that you'll be picking those up every time you start it but it's only one small deck of cards it's not even a full deck um so that wasn't a huge deal so now, i think you could have we could have probably put that in another spot it would have stayed better mm -hmm. i just tried to put it back where it came out of well, yeah, no, understandably. But there wasn't, I mean, there wasn't a, there's no designed place to hold it where it's not going to slide yeah, around. You'd, not, you'd have yeah, to bag the top it. cards aren't going to slide off. Yeah, you'd have to bag it. Uh, and now with, with the boxes, the great thing with this is it's a mix and match system. So mm -hmm. even though in the initial, in the retail box, you're only getting season one, uh, the Kickstarter people were able to get season two and some extra bit doodads. Uh, so you're getting six scenarios, uh, episodes one through six, and two uh See, uh, Elder Demon boxes, but you now mix and match those. So you've actually, right out of the box, got 12 completely different possible scenarios mm -hmm. you can be playing. Uh, and I think from what I could tell, they really are pretty different just by swapping, you know, uh, episode one between He Who Shall Not Be Named and Cthulhu are going to be reasonably different scenarios. Um, oh, I agree. Once you pick your scenario and your Elder God to fight, you're going to pick a character. There were plenty of options. Uh, I didn't count, but like way more than one per player, way more than five. I think it was probably eight or ten. Um, I was actually really pleased to see the selection of characters. Not only did you have men and women, not only did you have people of color, but they actually included an amputee. That is not something you see and it is awesome to see in 2019. And they had a non-sexualized child as well. Yes. Uh, it you know it's really nice to see something as simple as what is in in a sort of very distilled essence a shoot 'em up, mm -hmm. taking the time to be that you know fully uh, inclusive conscious. in its yeah. and conscious of its characters. Uh, for again, it's really just a shoot 'em up. It's a, it's a really fun shoot 'em up, and they still took the time and effort for that. Yeah, and Deanna points out in the chat room full range of ages too. You had kids yep. to old older people. Yep, it was nice to see. Now, when you pick your character, you get three skills. These are on a character card. Uh, two of the skills other people may have, but one of which is unique, making it somewhat asymmetric. Adding to the asymmetry, you're going to draw a card from the Psychosis deck. Everyone's going to have their own. This is an in-game effect that goes off as your character descends into insanity. This is a Cthulhu game. It's an inevitable part of the game. Of course, there's insanity in the game. Uh, there's a significant deck of these, and they include a ton of things. One of the most amusing, at least I thought amusing, was the Obsessive Compulsive, where when you collect items, they go on the right side of your board or the left side, and you have to have an equal number on both sides. Uh, my particular character, when I played, had a problem where they would go into a catatonic state and lay on the floor quivering, which actually was an in-game bonus because all the bad guys would avoid me while I was drooling on the floor. Now, there are certainly some people who will take issues with this game's use of uh, mental instability, mental health yeah. problems. Uh, and while we understand that, at the same point, part of the Cthulhu miso mythos is the fact that it is driving you out of your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. It is too much for the human mind to comprehend, and the human mind compensates by developing psychoses. Uh, no one is expecting, or no one should be expecting, a realistic portrayal of mental health mental disabilities illness. and mental illness in this game. Uh, and I don't think what they saw was especially uh, gratuitous. Yes, it's there, and for better or worse, but uh, even like the OCD um, aspect, um, there was game issues. It wasn't as simple as 
make moving things left and right because it looked better that actually has a game effect because these mm -hmm. left and right sides of your item cards actually have different effects so it wasn't as simple as making things look pretty and minimizing the dangers of OCD and, and the, the, the real impact of OCD. It actually had real impact on that character. Um, so yeah, basically what my, my suggest would be to check out our episode on potentially problematic content. Know that it's here, make your own decision, whether this is something you are willing to support or not. Personally, I think it's part of the genre. It's part of the trope. It's part of the Cthulhu mythos always has been. And this game is going to push it because this is an over the top Cthulhu game. And everyone's got a psychosis and they're going to hit multiple times. And uh, we lost the game due to a psychosis when we played because someone just couldn't handle themselves and attacked everyone around them. That's the kind of thing you're going to expect from this game. Now, once everyone is their characters, you're going to set up the map based on the scenario box. It's going to have tiles and put counters out and stuff like that. Now, the goal of the game, there's a ritual going on. You have to stop it. The ritual is trying to summon an elder god. If you're too slow, the elder god's going to get summoned, which could suck. If you can stop the elder, uh, stop the ritual, you actually can then harm the elder god. It becomes flesh and can be killed. It's then up to the players to kick some butt and take down that elder god. Now there is also a time limit uh, that is reached. Uh, if the the elder god progresses too far along the track, you just lose. Uh, you can also lose if one character dies before the ritual is disrupted, or if all characters die after it's disrupted. Yeah, it's nice that there's a variety of win-lose scenarios here. Uh, it's not just a simple, if the god comes, you die. If the god doesn't, you win. No, no, yeah. there's the god is going to come. Uh, <laughs> you are going to fight the big baddie. You don't have any way around that. Uh, you, you know, it's not going to be so easy that you just blow through it and don't have to worry about Cthulhu. Uh, no, he's going to show up and it's going to hurt. Um, but, uh, you know, there are multiple ways to both lose and, uh, and win. So again, it's, you know, the flexibility in the game is really strong. And a correction, we did win. I was forgetting that I died and then realized I could have spent something and came back. We had thought we lost and then didn't. I played a lot of games over the last few days. Sorry. <laughs> We did win. We did take a lot of damage from Tori in particular's character's problem. <laughs> All right, so on your turn, you're going to take three actions. They're simple. Running, which is moving. Attacking, which is attacking something on the board. Resting, which you can do if no one's around to get your health back and your energy back. And trading items. That's it for your basic actions. Nice and simple. In addition, each scenario has two special actions. I thought this was neat. It was just a neat mechanic. Each of the six scenarios has six different actions. In the one we played, the only one I remember, I remember one of them was there were laboratories and cultists were trying to set fires at these laboratories and we could smash the laboratories. That's how we had to disrupt the rituals. And then our other, remember what our our other one was action. putting out fires because uh, they, yes. they were setting fires and, and part of the, the theme of the whole uh, thing was, was fires everywhere. Lots and lots yeah. of fire. There was uh, lots of fires. <laughs> because basically the scenario was, what's worse than cultists? Cultists lighting fires. That was the theme of our mission. Yep. Um, attacking and doing scenario actions like fighting fires means rolling dice. Rolling dice in this means rolling three black dice. These are custom dice um, that, that are unique to the game. If you were skilled in something, you got some additional green dice. Plus, if you're far enough on the insanity track, you also got some green dice. You're looking for exclamation marks. If you have at least one exclamation mark, you succeed. Um, there are other symbols. Uh, elder sign symbols, which set off special effects, usually tied to your character skills, and then tentacles, and tentacles cause you to lose sanity. Green dice have less harmful symbols on them than the black ones do, so we're always good. So you always wanted more green dice. I, the basics of the game is you want to get more dice. So you are, you are doing whatever necessary, uh, and we'll get to what is necessary in a second, but you're doing whatever is necessary to get more dice so that you have more chances to beat things up. Yep, you're looking for more exclamation points. Uh, now, sanity in this game is very different from every other Mythos game I played. Every Cthulhu game, every every Lovecraft game has some type of sanity mechanic in it. And this is a game that kind of inverts what you usually say. In Death May Die, the more sanity you lose, the more powerful you get. Losing sanity unlocks new skills, adds more green dice to your pool, and gives you more options. But... If you lose too much, you can still be eliminated from the game. It's a very cool push your luck mechanic where you're trying to get your character to the brink, to the very edge, 
to be able to take out the Elder God without going too far. And essentially, uh, my character in this case basically did that. Uh, I, I got positioned into a ideal place early in the game and was protected by the rest of the team. And as I went in slowly insane, I became powerful enough that I was essentially taking on Cthulhu almost by myself uh, in order to wear him down to get finished off. Now, I died moments before the end of the game, but you I had all... You went insane. I, 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 I was sorry. Incurably yes. insane. Incurably insane. Uh, and, and, but I, I had done enough at that point that it was okay because there was, it was easy enough for everyone else to finish him off at that point. Uh, so, but because I, uh, gave up my sanity early enough in the game and gained that power quickly, I was able to basically do heavy damage early on. Yeah, Sean's character was basically a little girl that as she lost her mind could start more fires yeah. further away. Yeah, I shot, <laughs> I shot fire from hands at, at things, basically. Now, after every character's turn, you're going to draw a mythos card and the baddies do something. Very Shadows Over Camelot to me. Um, after the mythos phase, all the monsters in the room are going to attack any people with them. Or sorry, are going to attack you. It only attack you on your turn. So if you're in a room with monsters, they attack you. They use the same dice. Uh, the interesting thing to note is it doesn't matter who's rolling the dice. If you roll the insanity symbols, the tentacles, you lose sanity. So both on your turn and the mythos turn, the bad guy's turn, you can lose sanity. Which again, you kind of want that to happen, but not too much. Um, if you finish your turn in a room and there are no monsters, you get to investigate. So here's your investigation research that you're used to seeing in these games. But in this, it's really simple. You draw a card from the investigation deck. You read the middle of it. It usually means you found someone or something and you get a choice. These choices are, um, moral choices. I will say, um, they're not explicit, but they very much hint at you do a good thing or a very bad thing. If you do the very bad thing, you tend to get better stuff but then it can lead to your descent into madness. Um, or you do the good thing and you get followers and things like that. I'm not going to get into the details here of that, but basically you're going to read through, make a choice, and you're going to get something from it. Yeah. Most of the cards are positive. I didn't. Re I don't think we saw any that were just a bad thing. It was always you either got something, got nothing, or moved on. Yeah. It's it's a real, It's de they're definitely choices, though. Uh, you're... you're you don't get anything for free is essentially yeah. part of the part of the thing. I, or I think, I think there were some very minor objects that were, that had no real notable effect. Uh, but if you wanted something better, then you were going to pay for it in some, some manner. In some way. Yeah. So, and then there were cards that didn't happen in our game, but they would come back to haunt you. So say you did the bad thing, you would get a card that marked, I'm trying to remember the term that was on the cards. And it kept saying, if you are, if you have oh, a guilty conscience, guilty conscience, guilty yeah. conscience. So if you did the bad thing, you would get a guilty conscience card. And many times we had cards that said, if you have a guilty conscience, this nasty thing happens to you. Yeah. In our game, no one got a guilty conscience. So yeah, no, we we were we were nice people. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's basically it for the game. Uh, take three actions, move. Bad guys, move. Try to stop the ritual. Stop the ritual. Kill Cthulhu or Pastor. I'll say it once. Just make sure I don't say it three times. <laughs> um. So final thoughts. When I got this game, I was expecting Arkham Horror with fancy minis. I, I was expecting a four to six hour slog of flipping cards, moving my pawn around the map, having people read out to me what horrible things was happening to my character and having to make decisions on where to go and being frustrated that stuff was too far away and stuff like that. I, a game where you're doing research and investigating and gathering clues, trying to figure out how to banish the evil big baddie before going insane. And that's that not is what not this is. This game at all. That is not this. This is yeah, okay, maybe you get clues, but more likely you're going to go in and have to kill some cultists and smash stuff. Sorry. Go in and smash some stuff. And once you smash that stuff, a great old one's going to show up and you're going to have to kick it. This game is way more about kicking a star spun's butt back to where it came from. Uh, losing your sanity in this game is a good thing. It's what makes you more capable of dealing with the threats at hand. You're going to want to push your sanity to the brink and bring the pain. Just watch you don't go too far. This is two-fisted pulp Cthulhu, not research and investigation Cthulhu. This is the Cthulhu of Robert E. Howard, not the Cthulhu of H.P. Lovecraft we're used to seeing. And I got to say, I love seeing this as a difference to what is usually out there.
No, absolutely. I, I When I came down on Friday, uh, I, I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting into after watching the unboxing the night before, but it was really enjoyable to just sort of sit down and because we had a rough weekend ahead, not have a brain burning game mm -hmm. and just kick some demon butt. You know, yeah. it, <laughs> that was that was what we did. And that was what sort of uh, fit and it felt great to do. Yeah. And then added to that, this game is ridiculously quick to set up and get to the table. Like this is I, this is a game I don't think you necessarily need to read the rule book first. You could break this out with your friends, open it up, flip through the rules and get it to the table like in a, less than half an hour. The rules are clear and concise, and I got to say simple, but not in a, oh, it's a simple game way, but as in a really quick to pick up really, what you do is just simple. You move, you attack. If there's nothing to fight, you research, draw a card, make a choice, done. Uh, if you roll those tentacles, bad things happen to you. Uh, gameplay is lightning quick. Uh, player turns go really quick. Even with five players, it just flowed. It just, it went around the table. It was going really quick. Yeah. We were playing in minutes. Yeah, no, the the it's there because the the your your actions are set out right there. Everything's right out in front of you. You can see everything. Uh, can, movement is easy because it's working by rooms. You're not worrying worrying yep. about hexes or squares or no counting. line of sight rules at all. You're just yeah. Well, and then that that may actually come up under one of the problems. I think in some <laughs> degree, but uh, yeah. So I mean, everything is right there, and you know you're rolling and running. It's yep. that simple. Now, Sean's already alluded to it a couple times. It's not all sunshines and roses. I do have some complaints about Cthulhu Death May Die. Now, my first two are really minor, things that can probably be overlooked. The third could be a game breaker and almost was for me. Now, the first thing is, as Sean mentioned earlier, is not being able to fit all the damn minis on the board. The map tiles are just too small. Like, they look great, but they should have been at least twice the size. Or the miniatures half the size, but no one wants that. Like, if you had a room with a cultist or two and one character, you're fine. But then once you have to start throwing in flame counters and relay counters and a lab counter, it's already crowded. But then once you have even one of the larger monsters, there's not enough room. The Cthulhu mini itself takes up one small room, and there's not room to put other minis on its base or anything like that. It's just, there's no way to do it. You just can't fit them. Plus, there's the minis, then there's the counters that you're supposed to put there, too. Yeah, no, the the fact that Cthulhu literally takes up all but the very border of a small-sized room yep. is incredibly crazy. Like, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, luckily, he spawned in a large room, so we didn't even necessarily realize it immediately. But even earlier in the game, uh, a one-relay token, a couple of fires, and two cultists and a character, yeah. you're out of space. You're already starting to keep track of things off the edge of the tile. Mm -hmm because you've already run out of space. And that is really unfortunate. Uh, to, to, to think that within the first three turns, I think uh, the full, first full three times around the board, we had run out of space in rooms, that was concerning. And then to acerbate that problem, once things get damaged, you track it by putting tokens on the board. This is horrible. This is a terrible way to track damage in any modern game. Cool Mini or not expects you to put counters out next to the miniatures on the board. Now, even if the rooms were huge, this is impractical. Like, first off, it's terrible because, as Sean said, you got two cultists in there, you got a character, you got a relay token, three fire tokens, and a lab token. You put down this little heart token in there, and then within 10 seconds, wait, was, was that this cultist or this cultist? Like, it's terrible for that. But even with that, like, all the, all the tokens are round. Like, just, they don't, they should be pointy, so you can point at what miniature they're at. There's not enough room to put them there. And then, like, multiple times we'd be playing and we'd, oh, cultists all charge forward, we'll run square, and you'd move them. And we'd look and go, oh, wait, whose heart was this? Where, who was that from? Right? It just, oh, it's a terrible way to track damage. Yeah. And there aren't even any, in some for the cultists especially, there aren't actually ways to really do it better. Because, sure, you could have cards off to the side, but there's no way to link up that cultist with a card on the side that you were tracking data on, at least with, you know, your demons. If you've got Cthulhu, you can have a Cthulhu oh, yeah. card off to the side. Uh, some people have suggested, you know, photocopying something and, and keeping track of your damage that way. Uh, but with the cultists, if you've got three cultists in a room and one of them runs away, you you really have to sort of pay, be, really have to have been paying attention uh, right up to the minute yeah. to know which damage counters are going with them. Now, there, there's ways you can fix this, right? Like, I immediately thought, back when I ran 4th edition D&D, I have Litgo Arrow System uh, laser-cut tokens that I used to put under the minis. 
And that's all I have to do is start throwing bloody tokens under my cultists and make a stack under them until they're dead. Like uh, the photocopy, you could photocopy a bunch of cultists and then paint the bases different colors or put stickers on them that say one, two, three, four. That's the way they do it in Imperial Assault and it works. But you, there is no way in the box, which yeah. is frustrating. There are lots of people out there that propose better ways of tracking things. So I got to say, like, yeah, it sucks. Not everything fits on the map. Yeah, it sucks. The keeping track of it doesn't break the game. No, it, but... it still works. It's, a, it's an annoyance. It might be a major annoyance to some people. I found it relatively minor. We just have to come up with a better system. Maybe we stack the damage underneath, but then you're not going to know how much damage people are taking. You're going to want to have to pick them up, whatever it happens to be. My biggest complaint, though, and one that I haven't seen a fix for, unless someone's done something on their own, is that this is not a campaign game. Despite the fact we are saying that it comes with Season 1 and six scenarios as part of Season 1, and theoretically, these tell a link story. This is not a campaign. When you sit down to play, you pick any of the scenarios you own, one through six with the core box, or if you kickstarted it, you could start on season three, scenario two. There's no reason you have to play these in order. Not only that, but what you do in one scenario has zero, zilch, nada, no effect on any future game you will play. This shocks me because this was designed by Rob Davio. The godfather of the legacy game, the man behind Risk Legacy, Pandemic Legacy, Seafall. Like, I was honestly shocked to learn there's no campaign element to Death May Die. Shocked, and I've got to say, very disappointed. So essentially, what you've got in the retail box is 12th place before you have to start restarting. So if you've got a, if you've got a regular group of players, you're going to sit down and you can do episodes one through six with Cthulhu. And then come back and do episodes one through six with You Shall Not Be Named. And then you have now played every scenario. Now, I mean, that's 12 weeks. And that may be more than worth your money. That's that's totally a call we leave up to you. But well, also, you could try all of those with different sets of characters, which does add replayability. This sure. is not a legacy game. Like sure. the way Sean's saying it, no, you can replay mm -hmm. scenario one versus Cthulhu. I can totally see doing it. You haven't, there's nothing spoiled. There, because this is not an investigation game, because you're not finding clues and you're not having to solve a mystery, nothing gets spoiled by playing the game. Nothing gets so spoiled except, nothing to stop but at you. the same time, once you've beaten it, I, 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 I don't know, try it with a different group of characters. That's like every board game out there. Once you play Puerto Rico, you've seen everything that happens. I don't see that any different than playing Scenario 1 versus Cthulhu. You've played it, you see everything that happens, you could enjoy it again with a different group of players. Well, except I see, I see a difference between, whereas when you're playing versus a, a co-op versus board game versus a competitive game. Uh, a competitive game has more replayability to me yeah. than, than a co-op with a set scenario. But um, you're not ruining the game. There is no, nothing absolutely to stop not. you from replaying those scenarios again. Absolutely not. And again, I'm talking minimums. Uh, you know, again, minimum 12 plays because to get the full experience um, before you start experimenting, you know, without experimenting with characters and, and whatnot and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so again, 12 plays isn't all that bad. Uh, I don't know what retail cost is. Do you know what MSRP is? No, off, off of the, uh, uh, off I'm, the top I'm of my head. Though. Yeah, I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's not sure cheap. I'm sure it's not cheap. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but, you know, 12 game, even if you just say it's 12 games, um, you know, it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be a hundred dollar game. So, um, I'm going to guess more than a hundred. Oh, okay. I, I get the miniatures. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Cool. Uh, mini or not miniatures. We are looking at no less than I thought. So season one, I don't know if this is accurate, but it's pre-order on Amazon right now for 79. Okay. Season two is also 70. So you're looking at almost the full price of the game for additional seasons. Individual elder gods are 30 bucks each. Okay. Um, alternate figures are 35. There's the wow. There's a lot of stuff out. Yeah, you can buy. You can buy a lot. The Kickstarter really went over well, so there's a lot there. Yeah. But I don't. You know, to me, I, I don't think 80 dollars for this game, even no, if you I, just played it, even if you just played it 12 times and put it away, that's not a bad deal because it was a really fun game for five people. So, so that gets back to me. Now, I can admit, I was disappointed. Um, Solon, who gave me the game to unbox, was a little worried when he saw the unboxing video, and I was so bummed to find out it doesn't. I like campaign games. I'm a role player. I want to level up a character. I, I want what I do in one scenario to affect the next, right? Again, we have a whole podcast about the difference between campaign and scenario play and my love of campaign play. I was really bummed that this did not have campaign play, especially with Rob Davio's name on the box, right? Like, to me, it almost feels like false advertising. 
I, I, I guess I'm, I'm bad for trying to make Rob a one stick pony, but I just felt like it should have, especially with the box. I'm like, oh, there's going to be boxes to open. No, you like you have more campaign play in Harry Potter Hogwarts battle than you do in this. But that all said, and the fact I'm bummed that it's not a campaign game, I did have a lot of fun playing Cthulhu Death May Die. This is a really solid cooperative dice chucker. It's very accessible, very easy to learn, lightning quick to get to the table. Pick a scenario, pick a god, go kick some butt. I love how different this is from all the other Mythos games I've played. At this point, I would say this is my, uh, my I can't even talk, my favorite Cthulhu based game. I am not a huge fan of Arkham Horror, Elder Horror, Elder Sign, Tower of Madness, or any of those. I am a fan of this. I strongly suggest anyone who wants something a bit different from their Lovecraft-inspired tabletop games, all about investigating and finding the clues and finding the right book and putting the symbols in the right order, toss all that out, take a look at this, check this game out. This is a two-fisted pulp dice chucker, scenario-based, but not a campaign. Don't come here if you're looking for a campaign. To read that, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Uh, what the heck? We should probably jump into the lobby here. That's oh. missing. Shouldn't there be one right here? Oh, uh, we, we had some adjustments. We're in the lobby now. <laughs> All right. All Just because right. I saw some thoughts going by, um, Jeff, there was one. He said, Herbert West versus Charles Dexter Ward. That was exactly my point, right? That's the that's the the feel of this. This is, the, like I said, the Robert E. Howard style Cthulhu, the, the kick Cthulhu's butt, not the slow descent into madness, yeah. which I thought was really neat, a very unique way to uh, to present it. And uh, so different, and, and it's an Eric Lang game, and it's not poke on a map it's minis but it's not that i thought that was really neat it, i mean it, there is a psychological aspect but it's a physically related psychological aspect really uh you know again that whole psychosis is driving the characters further uh and in in accomplishment to the to that edge before they fall off the edge at the you know yeah. at their inevitable end um, the other thing i thought this did a really good job of is the pulp genre the, the pulp trope i guess it would be the, that you see in all pulp where you get beat down at the beginning as you suck. You, you are losing. The cultists are hard to defeat. You feel overwhelmed. Everything's getting lit on fire. Oh my God, we're going to lose to no, you just start slowly battling back, right? You're going to the point where you're getting tougher and tougher. The more you get beat up. So the, it's the Indiana Jones, right? Indiana Jones get his butt whipped, but at the end, He's now punching out Germans, yeah. right? It's the it's that style of it's the Dresden Files also leans heavily on the pulp influence, right? If you read the Dresden Files novels, it's Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up. Oh, Harry starts fighting back, then Harry's kicking ass. That there's more of a yeah. up and down in there. Usually he fights back for a bit and then gets beat down again. But that's you, you basically get that Spider Man, same thing, yes, yeah. right? And <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, yeah. So Jeff, Jeff saying, is beating up the Elder God difficult or is it super pulpy? I would say it's actually rather difficult. Uh, the the one thing, and we we mentioned that we I briefly mentioned this in the the review. The one thing that sort of holds it back from being difficult is line of sight. Um, yeah. Again, my character was able to shoot initially one room away, and then it was, it was as like I powered up, two rooms away. Um, and, and it wasn't so even the two rooms, it was the fact the rooms were down a set of stairs. Yeah. So, so like... I was shooting out a hallway and then down a set of stairs to hit Cthulhu. Yeah. That uh, was a little, funny. and we had to double check. Uh, that was like the one reason we pulled up in the rules because like, really, is this really possible? And yes, it was. I mean, the rules yeah, specifically I wonder stated, if FAQ might come out for that. Yeah. And, and you had to kick Cthulhu's butt four three, times. I think, uh, it was. three, I think it was just three deaths. Was this, well, cause first he summons. And then when he summons, something happens. And then with Cthulhu, something happens at the end of every round once he's there. You have to do 12 damage to him. So you're looking for 12 exclamation points. And at this point, the most dice you're probably rolling is four. So four if you get five, really yeah. lucky, you're going to do four damage. Um, then you do 12 damage to him. Then he switches to a new Cthulhu where he starts summoning cults, as I think. And you have to beat do 12 damage to him again. And then he gets even more tough, and yeah. you have to do another 12 damage. So every every time he evolves, you keep the last set of effects and have to do another 12 yeah. damage. So yeah, it's, everything's it's rough. Back. So like the, yeah. the, the first Cthulhu's effects still happening, the second Cthulhu, 
for the second, what do we call it? The evolution, right? They're yeah. like, this is not my final form. Yeah. yeah, we were joking about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, no, it was definitely fun, though. I mean, there was just yes. something about being a screaming, screaming, laughing child shooting fire bolts at an elder god that really kind of, you know, was uh, relaxing. Yes, uh, stage two fight, boss fight music. It, 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 was, it was the end of... Um... Final Fantasy, One-Winged Angel going on for sure, where you're like, I finally beat Sethroth! Oh, no, he's back. Oh, I finally beat Seth. Oh, no, he's back. Except we knew that there was a pile of decks you had to go through, and yeah. that's the same for both Elder Gods. Well, the two we, we have yeah. is you have to fight through multiple incarnations. Um, I don't know. We played Scenario 1. Maybe Scenario 1's easier than the other ones. Uh, I gotta admit, at the beginning, it felt pretty desperate. Like, it did it not did. feel like we were doing well. And, we and had... Realistically, if we had had, if there had been cultists in the room with me, it would have been a very different game. Yep. So Yeah, and the cultists just kept coming. They are. And coming, and coming. Well, and, and we, we cleared out, oh we, my God, fire. we cleared out the fire of my room, and that was one of the big things, was because there was nothing else in my room to catch fire, yeah. Uh, that was nice, but everywhere else was just engulfed in flames. Yeah, we had a lot. Of, we ran out of fire tokens, which was very clear in the rule book that if you run out of tokens, you stop. Like there, there is a cent amount of things. Yeah, which we were able to meta game, which was interesting. But you know what? That's that's pretty much a co op game thing. Yeah. Meta gaming and co op games kind of go hand to hand. Yeah, I would like to see more dice though, because I ran out, and I don't feel yeah. like it's going to be no, that hard to dice. run out of dice. We found out the dice were save the number and reroll. Yeah, but just add more dice. I mean, you, there's a set yeah. number of maximum dice you're able to roll. Um, they, they just didn't include enough dice. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it's probably rare that you get that many. <laughs> I don't know. I think if you get up high enough, depending on which which skill you level up, yeah. some of them will give you more green dice, and you always get more as you, always you get more, yes. go insanity anyway. So, I don't know. It seems like they, they might have chinsed a little bit on that. But, you know. Not, and I said, going insane yeah. can hurt your friends. That was part of it, too, that we didn't yep. really get into in the review. But it, there's you get a track, and on the track are multiple stop points. And anytime you hit those stop points, you level up. But your, um, get the term for it, your insanity, that's not the proper psychosis. term. Psychosis. Your psychosis. Your psychosis goes off. And, like, one of our characters' psychosis was they damaged everyone in the room with them, including our friends, right? Like, they yep. weren't all, like, mine was I go catatonic and I miss my turn, which was not as as bad. Uh, quarterbacking, I think it was so-so. We we were telling each other what to do somewhat, but this was much more of a you're playing your own character. It was it was you're asymmetric making enough. The decisions on what to level up, and you tended to each be good at something. Like my character was good at soaking damage, and I think in general, at least on our first few plays, it's going to be your focus on your own character. Once you played a bunch and you know what everyone else's abilities are, I could see it happening more. Like, yeah. hey, don't you have that ability? Yeah. But because we were all focused on our own characters, there wasn't, I didn't know what Sean could do, so I couldn't tell him what to do. Yeah, I think if you if you learned all the characters, um, even then you'd still have to think about the psychoses. So, yeah, I mean, there's, would... there's enough asymm asymmetry in the game that you really can sort of minimize that quarterbacking uh, just purely due to the, to the yeah. amount of, of potential uh, things that are happening. And then again, with each scenario being different enough, um, what you have to achieve is going to be different enough that, you know, I, I, I suspect, uh, while if you've played the whole thing, yes, you can probably quarterback it, but until then you, it's probably minimized. Yeah. It, it didn't seem to be like, not to the extent I've seen it in pandemic and I could see there was some, this was more of, um, plus the pulpy feel, right? This was a dice chucker. There, this was a, an Ameritrash game. This was no Euro. This was rolling dice. And it was, eh, I'm going to try this, or eh, I'm going to try that and see if it works. It was all output randomness, not input randomness. Yep. So, like, you could tell someone, eh, you should go attack that cultist. Like, well, I only get four dice. You can't be like, here, move here, do this. This will happen for sure. And when that happens, you should do this because that happened. You couldn't plan like that. Like, in Pandemic, that's why yep. you have the quarterbacking. Is It's all open info, and it's like, well, if you do this, 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 and this, here's our result. Whereas... In this game, you don't know. You're like, here, you could go try to do this yeah. or try to do that, and then you're going to roll the dice and see if it works. You can head over there, but you're either going to succeed and kill the cultist, or you're going to lay on the floor and drool. Like, we did we did yeah. have the usual uh, co-op game thing, where it's like, yeah. we discussed. It. I think you should probably go over here and fight the fire, or should you go smash the labs? Yeah, yeah you know what? We're not smashing labs. You should I'm, smash labs. I'm not, I'm not leaving this room a... because I can help us win if I stay here. <laughs> Again, yeah. you know. 
There was never a where someone picked up another person's character and went move here. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. All righty, I think we should get going on. All right, shifting on. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more. With several things in the works, now this is the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, YouTube videos, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, you can join the Bellhop team Thursday night at 9 p.m. on Twitch at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. You never know exactly what we're going to stream. Last week, I did a five unboxing videos, including Cthulhu Death May Die, which we're talking about this episode. Uh, sometimes we're just going to play some video games. This is a chance for Sean, Deanna, and I to hang out together online, shoot the, the, the stuff, and uh, play some games. So we may be going back to some Knights of the Old Republic this week because I think I need a break. I do have some more stuff to unbox, but just show up Thursday and see what we're doing. Absolutely. All right, you may have noticed some new social media badges for Tabletop Bellhop out there. This is our first step in our effort to rebrand the brand, re-change re the look. We're still sticking to Tabletop Bellhop. I'm still your cardboard concierge. The content we're producing is all the same. We were just looking for some new logos, a new look. A uh, big shout out to Brian Weiss of RPG and Co for working with us on the new Bellhop logo and branding. You can expect to see this change roll out to all of our content in the coming weeks. And you can check out RPG and Co by going to playrpgandco.com. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. And I think we got all three this week. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, this past weekend, gamers around the world took part in a charity gaming marathon called Extra Life. Uh, this huge gaming event raises money for the Children's Miracle Network Hospital. Here in Windsor, the entire Bellhop team spent pretty much the entire weekend volunteering and taking part in our local Extra Life event held at the CG Realm. Games were played, baked goods were sold and consumed, coffee was drunk, auctions happened, and we raised a lot of money for a good cause. Absolutely. Now, I want to say to anyone who happened to have been online and tried to donate and ran into some problems, I want to apologize. There were some bad actors who became involved with the Extra Life uh, website and were causing issues. Uh, please, if you did try to donate, and we apologize if there were any problems, but I would like to mention that you still can donate all the way up until December 31st. So just because the event is over, money can still be donated to the cause at uh, windsorextralife.com. Yeah, it they, they was... I've had complaints from people who tried to donate. So we are we are still obviously accepting donations all the way up until the end of the year. And even after that, we'll start raising for next year. So in uh, our effort to answer your gaming and game night questions, the answer, the question that we are answering tonight is how did we do during the Windsor Extra Life Gaming Charity, Charity Gaming Weekend? Part of it is we did not get enough sleep, which is probably why this episode sounds a little more rough than our usual. <laughs> Uh, this past weekend, the awesome gamers of Windsor, Ontario, as long with some very much appreciated online donations coming from actually all over the world, managed to raise over $5,000 at our Charity Gaming Marathon this year. Now, I'm going to break it down just a little bit, not going to get into all the details, but the biggest fundraiser of the year, uh, every year, and this year not excluded, is our Geek and Gaming Auctions. Uh, these feature new and used games and other geeky items. Uh, this year, we had a ton of great donations from the local community, as well as donations from 16 different game publishers who provided sealed games for the auction. Huge shout out to Neil Helmler for doing the work to contact those companies. Uh, this year, the live auction itself raised over $2,400, and the silent auction raised just over half that at about $1,200. 
Saturday, we had the local Artemis team on site. Uh, they were showing off the awesome Artemis Starship Bridge Simulator. Uh, this is basically a Starship LARP played on laptops and computers. Very neat thing. They had a special scenario going for us over the weekend. They were getting new people to play. They raised money online as well as accepting donations on site and raised us over $200. So thanks, Artemis. Now on Sunday morning, uh, fresh and early and, uh, and, and fresh off the, uh, the overnight crew, Solon of Tabletop Renaissance hosted an X-Wing tournament featuring, pri featuring prizes from Asmodee Canada, which brought in over $180. Another big thing that was going on all weekend were some great RPG tables. Uh, there was Siren Tuzno was running. Kieran Tuzno was running a D and D game for a ridiculous number of hours um, with some help and co DMs running that. Kevin Doak had a fantastic 3D ziggurat there, running through a Warhammer Fantasy role play game that ran for over eleven hours. Uh, Jeff Seuss ran a couple of great Dungeon Call Classic games. Altogether, they raised over $100, mostly from people cheating to keep their characters alive. And there had to be a lot of cheating, because when I saw the bottom of that ziggurat, there were a lot of lesser demons running around in there. <laughs> and then there was all the other stuff. The bake sale. Um, Brent, who set up a little portable escape room. The board game Bliss gift card raffle cash donations. And, of course, cheat jars. Uh, in total, we actually raised over $5,100 this past weekend, and I couldn't be more proud of everyone. Yeah. Now, a big thanks to our sponsors. So, you want to... <laughs> all right. This is going to be a big list, but I think all these people deserve to be heard and to know about. So, of course, the CG Realm, our, uh, our venue for the year, Hidden Trail Escape Room, the Coffee Exchange, who actually let us go pick up more coffee at 11 o'clock at night, uh, the Broadswords all woman podcasting crew, the tabletop bellhop team, level 99 games, first frontier logistics, easy mode esports lounge, geek life blog, Spartan Sling, board game bliss, odd bird, industrial tool and supplies, Garfield games, GMT games, parallel games, far off games, MSI, mind clash games, green feet games, chip theory games, Aries games, Atlas games, Weird City Games, Leader Games, Albers Tool and Mold, Stronghold Games, 3D Game Shop, Steve Jackson Games, and CLM. That's right. And those are all the companies who helped make this another fantastic year of extra life. We broadcast the entire uh, day. I think we, we ended up crashing out about... 33.5 hours is what the stream says. Is that what it says? So we, we actually, we, we, we crashed a little bit earlier than I, than I wanted to, I know, because... Uh, at the towards the end, I didn't go over and hit a button on the camera, so I think the battery on it died a little bit a little ah. bit before we actually uh, shut it all down. But I think we were within 15 minutes of going from start to finish, nonstop, no drop frames of the entire uh, the entire show. Uh, we had uh, one wide shot set up the entire event so that you could see what was going on. And every once in a while, we zoomed in on some various games or put a roaming cam out on a table to see what was going on. Uh, it wasn't quite as involved as I was wishing we had, but I think we got a very good coverage. And uh, it was a great start for, uh, you know, what is, you know, a, a continually evolving stream for the Extra Life. Uh... Yeah, and I do have to thank everyone who stopped by the stream. We did have some chatters in there. We did get a couple donations while the stream was up, so I don't know if they came from the stream or through Twitter or something else, uh, for people to stop by. The only thing I'd like to do is I'd like to somehow make it more interactive next year, but I'm just not sure how to do that, yeah. how to keep people's interest. Like, I get it. You guys are all doing your own extra life thing, and maybe you don't want to look at what everyone's doing in the CG realm. But I don't know. Some ways we can try to have people influence a game. I think next year what we need to do is schedule specific events. So that at this time, we are going to stream the tabletop bellhop team playing Cthulhu Death May Die. Yep. Spend money to cheat on their behalf or something, right? Like we need, I think we need highlight features yep. to do it. And I think that might make it at least get people for that time period. All right. So what games got played at the Windsor Extra Life event? Yeah, well, raising money is nice and helping the kids is awesome. Uh, the local Extra Life event is also a great chance for uh, locals to play some games. And it's a fantastic way to meet and game with new people. I met a bunch of local gamers I'd never met before and got to play a huge variety of games over the weekend. 
And that was awesome. And I'm really hoping to see some of the people I'd never seen before come out to some of our future events. We do do events at the CG Realm twice a month, and we're also at easy mode fairly often. Now, I started off the event with, um, after getting everything unloaded and set up, ready to go Saturday, the first game I played was Go Cuckoo. I just wanted something light, and I wanted to get something to the table and get going. I figured this was a fitting start to a charity gaming marathon. Uh, yet again, I was teaching the game to some experienced gamers who had never played it before. And as always with this game, it went over extremely well. Everyone loved it. And I saw many games of Go Cuckoo get played over the weekend. It's really hard not to love Go Cuckoo. We sold at least two copies from uh, uh, at, at the, the store, store, sold at least two copies this weekend because it really is just that much fun. Uh, and we played it again. We, we played it first thing after we were all set up, but then we got it to the table again later on in the middle of the night when we were all <laughs> a, little, uh, a little punchy and it was still a great fun game. So it's just, you know, it's just one of those games to keep in your back pocket. It's that much fun. Now, there was a ton of other games going on. I got to say Saturday was packed. That was probably the best Saturday we've seen for Extra Life. There was a ton of stuff. Um, a friend of mine, Steve, brought his copy of Too Many Bones. They had that going. Neil, a uh, local heavy gamer, was teaching Tricarion. Uh, there was the D&D &D group I already mentioned that played for at least 24 hours. I don't know when they stopped because I did take a nap at one point, but they gamed for at least 24 hours. Uh, I mentioned Dope Ziggurat was set up. He was trying to get people to play. Uh, there was a lot of going on and a lot of different options. Now, the next one I actually sat down to play, I sat down with Sean, was the new Minecraft Builders and Biomes game from Ravensburger. Now, this is a review copy that I got because Sean wanted to see the game, of all things. He, Sean from Hamilton, uh, Sean right over there, and noted he wanted to try it. So he's the one that hooked me up with a press contact from Ravensburger, and I got to thank them because they were more than happy to send me a copy. Absolutely. I, you know, I think this was this is one of the game that I was interested in trying because as we've talked about on the show in the past, I have tried the Minecraft card game and I feel sorry to anyone who else who has. Uh, <laughs> it, it bears no resemblance to Minecraft. It is at the very most, uh, at best, it is a, you know, re-themed something else that re-themed by someone who's never played the card, the card games. Uh, yeah. Whereas this, well, I think there are some questions as to how minecraft linked it really is um it, it's definitely along the right theme uh and and it was a much more solid game than yeah. i think either one of us expected really yeah i gotta say it was a solid game it, it, it's a tile drafting game where you're buying the tiles by having the right resources you get the resources from mining them from a big cube of individual blocks that really tied in the, the minecraft thing there uh, it, it's neat. You you make this cube at the beginning, you get cubes off it, you build stuff. Uh, the big thing here that was surprising to me, though, is that it is all about long-term planning. There are three scoring phases of the game, each of which you're looking to have different types of tiles in your playing area. And planning ahead was a big part of the scoring in this. It was really solid for a licensed game, way better than any other Minecraft game I've seen. Now, I do worry that to appeal to the mass market, to the Minecraft fans, this might be a bit too crunchy. That whole strategy of having to plan three scoring phases ahead may be a bit much. Plus, I don't think it's deep enough for hardcore gamers because it's still fairly light. So it's kind of in that limbo in between. So I don't know. Personally, I think if you're a Minecraft fan, check this out. If you're not a Minecraft fan, I think this is definitely a play before you buy. Try it out first. because There may not be enough there yeah. for you. I, I actually am starting to lean towards the idea that this could be a gateway game for Minecraft yes. players. Um, I think after, I, I suspect that my kids could probably figure out the thinking ahead after mm -hmm. playing a few times. It's going to be rough the first couple times. And, you know, I would stomp all over them because they just aren't ready to think that far ahead. Right. But I do think that after a, a little bit of experience, the kids would pick that up and would have that gamer mindset of planning ahead. And that's not a bad thing. But no, your kids are basically gamers at this point because they yeah. played the Duke and they played deck builders and they, they, they know some of the mechanics. So They do, but I, I, I think in general. I mean, Minecraft gamers are, you know, Minecraft players are gamers. It is not, a, it is not an easy game if you get into the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of it. That's true. So, you know. Yeah, I just, I, I wonder where this one's going to sit. I, I have a feeling it's probably going to flounder and not do well, which is sad because I think a lot of people are going to look at it and just think it's going to be a garbage game. Yep. And that's not the problem with it. It's not that it's a bad game. Yep. I just worry about how approachable it is for different groups. 
Uh, the next game I actually played was Gold West. Again, Sean played this one. Actually, interestingly enough, both Sean's this played this one. So we had Sean from Hamilton and Sean Hamilton at the same table with Deanna and I. We played a four-player game. Uh, at this point, it's only my second time playing Gold West. But this was my first play with more than two players, and I was very impressed. The game is surprisingly easy to teach. Uh, I'm really happy with how quick I can get that one out there. It looks a little overwhelming at first, but it's an abstract with really simple uh, simple icon, simple to see stuff. Uh, my main complaint last time I talked about this game was the fact that we played two player and it features area majority and area majority doesn't work great with two people. Well, thankfully with three and four players, it works great. So having more than two players really made the game shine even better. Uh, I got to say there was some really fierce competition for investment cards and man was in game end game scoring majorities. I have never seen an area majority game with that many ties and splitting of points. I, I think, in my opinion, I didn't actually go around the table, but I think everyone who played uh, had a good time and had positive things to say about the game. And all of us agreed we got to play again later, so we never actually did play again during Extra Life. Yeah, no, it was it was a really fun game, and I, I have to say it was really easy to pick up. Uh, again, I don't always do well picking up those uh, the, the, the brainy thinky games too fast. This one was not a problem. Uh, my only problem was I, I sort of uh, didn't pace myself I shot ahead to an early lead uh, and then floundered uh, sort of mid game. And uh, I mean, we, we all pulled up. It was, it was a short, it was a close game, I think, uh, mm -hmm. in scoring. Uh, but I I definitely fell back after taking an early lead because again, I'd flounder, I'd sort of overspent myself early and got myself into some trouble. Yeah, you grabbed a couple early investments at the, the penalty of not getting the area majorities or the, yeah. the coaching tracks. Yeah. But no, now definitely a good game. Yeah, at this point on Saturday, Doak Ziggurat was being explored. He got a local group. He got a bunch of players, which was awesome. Uh, the Artemis crew showed up and had their bridge simulator going. Uh, bids were rolling in for the silent auction, and we had pretty much a full house. Uh, we actually had a large group of casual gamers show up, which was cool. Uh, no problem with casual gamers. Uh, store copies of Monopoly, and the game of life got some good use. Uh, there was a second D&D table set up. There were some Yu-Gi-Oh players took over part of the sandwich shop. And to be honest, we actually had a slight problem here where we had a group show up where there was no table to play at. In a way, this is a good problem to have. Uh, we did manage to move some things around and find them a spot, but man, the place was hopping on Saturday. And I, I think overall it was a good thing. It wasn't at the point where we had to turn anyone away, but it was getting close to that that border. Yeah, it was it was busy and it was great because, uh, again, coffee and uh, bake sale were going really yeah, well when you've got well. that many uh, folks around. Yeah, it was nice. We had people showing up saying, how can I spend money? How can I give you guys money? And I'm like, well, you can give us money, but <laughs> if you want, buy baked goods, buy coffee, cheat, stuff like that. Yep. Um, just as Jeff's Dungeon Crawl Classics game was getting started, uh, Chad broke out Underwater Cities. I sat down with Stacy and her granddaughter and taught them how to play Monster Factory. Now, we didn't get a ton of kids out for this event. We did have some, and I was really glad someone gave me the heads up ahead of time to, hey, be sure to pick at the, be sure to pack some kids games and we did and i'm glad i did uh stacy and her granddaughter really love monster factory though i gotta admit stacy and even more so cav were a little mad at me for uh showing them a christmas gift they now had to buy <laughs> um but i did have fun playing with them and it was good to see kids out uh speaking of kids shortly after that my kids showed up with uh, my mother-in-law and this worked out well because what i did is i just hooked them up with stacy and her granddaughter and my kids started teaching them how to play games um, they played some Battleship and some other kids' games. Uh, looking around the room, I took a bit of break from gaming. I saw some Terraforming Mars, uh, Quacks of Quedlinburg. There was some ghost stories. Um, Chad was showing off Abomination, Heir to Frankenstein. I did see that Minecraft card game played. I even made a note to go over and show them the other game, but by the time I had a chance, they were gone. It was good. It, it, there was a good mix of games. I think at that point you were mainly streaming. Deanna was working on getting stuff set up for the the auctions at that point. Yeah, no, there was uh, there was still a, an awful lot of work uh, that Dee had to do, and and she worked like a champion throughout. I don't think we definitely couldn't have managed that uh, without her keeping on top of the uh, both the items and the uh, uh, the baked goods and coffee yeah. along the way. Next game I broke out was another Ravensburger game. Uh, when we wrote Ravensburger asking to review the Minecraft game, they asked if there's anything else I wanted to check out and sent me everything I asked for. So thank you, Ravensburger. One of those games was Horrified. Uh, this is the hot new co-op game featuring the Universal Monsters. Uh, 
this was my first time playing and teaching it. That was interesting because it was be almost a read the rule book and teach it. I had kind of flipped through it ahead of time. Uh, this is a co-op game. We set up a five-player game. Then one of the players had to leave because he was sharing pictures of the ziggurat on his phone and the person he was sharing the pictures to had to come to the store and see it. So not a bad reason to lose a player. So we played a four-player game. Um, this is a very well-produced and neat game. Uh, they did amazing work getting the aesthetic to work. Um, hand-drawn art instead of um, screenshots, which I thought was really cool. Uh, basically, in this game, you're moving around the map trying to collect items. The items are in three different colors, and they're of various numeric values. What you do with these items totally depends on which monsters you're fighting. So in this game, we are collecting red items to smash Dracula's coffins, and then yellow items to defeat him, which are holy items. And at the same time, we are looking for sets of all three colors to try to discover the home of the creature from the Black Lagoon and drive him off. Now, this game reminds me a bit of Cthulhu in Shadows Over Camelot because the player takes an action and then you draw from a monster deck and the monsters go. So that seems to be a new thing for co-ops. It's kind of see cool to see that mechanic come back because I originally saw it in Shadows Over Camelot years ago. There is a ton of hype out there for this game. And at this point, I've actually played more than just that Saturday at this point. I got to say it's justified. The hype out there, the hype is real. I have to say, yeah, I agree. We uh, Are we going to cover the additional plays or are we going to leave that for next week? I, I might leave it for next week because we did not game on Monday, so I won't have anything else to talk about. But if you want to, feel free. Oh, no, that's fine. We can keep going. Yeah, we have played more since since that Saturday. Yeah, because otherwise I don't know if I'll have anything to talk about next week. Because we'll be like, <laughs> no one came over on Monday because we were all burnt out from Extra Life. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in here, I couldn't tell you the exact time Brent from Hidden Trail Escape Room showed up and set up a portable escape room in the back, uh, challenging people to solve his puzzles while raising money for the cause. Uh, this was up and open right until the auction started, and as far as I could tell, the response seemed pretty positive. Unfortunately, he was only able to be there up until the auction, and Sean, Deanna, and I just didn't have a chance to try it out. I would have liked to have gotten that in there. I know uh, Kator were in there, and they really enjoyed uh, the time they had. Now, after Horrified, I met up with Dave Garby, who people may know from the Wargaming Tradecraft website, where Dave talks about miniature painting tips and modeling tips. Uh, Dave used to be a Windsor local, but he moved to Kitchener some years back. And I got to say, I love the fact that Dave comes back to Windsor for events like this and still keeps in touch. Uh, the main thing Dave was down for is he is an ambassador, basically, for Gaslands now. Gaslands is a post-apocalyptic vehicular combat game that uses Hot Wheels matchbox cards. And that is what I got to play next. Dave set up some really neat looking industrial scenery on a three by four wargaming table. Had each of us make really basic cars, like all our cars were identical, but we picked which side our machine gun went on. Uh, and then set up a track that had three gates. Um, it's really interesting system that's obviously based on X-Wing. The gear you pick, the gear you're in, determines which templates you can use. You then roll dice. Those can give you a chance to do things like change gears up or down. Uh, the, some of the dice could cause your car to spin out or slide or cause you to take hazard tokens. If you take too many hazard tokens, you lose control of your vehicle. The neat part is the slides and the spins you may want to do. And that's where you can pull off some really neat maneuvers, basically like drifting. The goal is to be the first player through all the gates and touch the finish line or be the last man standing, which I thought was interesting. And when we were playing, actually, Steve Joannis was so long, took him so long to get through the first gate. He's like, screw it. He's going to go a different way and just try to take us all out. Unfortunately, we never got to see the end of the game because we had to pause it for the live auction. I had hoped to return to the game after the auction, but uh, at that point, it got too late for a couple of the players and they went home. So we called that game a draw. I got to say, though, overall, Gaslands looks cool. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was definitely uh, an eye catcher. Uh, they had some uh, some really cool, uh, big electric, uh, you know, Frankenstein style switches set up on the table as part of the the scenery set around and big metal metal hunks sitting on the table. Uh, and so it looked great, really caught the eye, uh, and uh, I think it drew a lot of people over to see, oh, what the heck is this going on over here? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be something that'll grow now in Windsor because part of this was um, Dave was trying to teach Steve Joannis a bit better of the rules and how to teach the game so we can start having some local game nights. Right. Overall, I found the, the, the game itself was more approachable than I thought. This is not Car Wars. This is not a super heavy miniature game. 
with lots of points to worry about and building armies or anything like that. And there was a lot more going on the the templates and the dice that I thought, like the way like you can actually try to skid on purpose and that I found rather neat. I'm gonna try to make it out some local Glassland nights in the future. I think. Excellent. Now our live auction is always a big draw. Uh, it also tends to be the unofficial end of day one for a lot of locals. So once the auction was done, I gotta admit most of the crowd headed home. Regretfully, I would have preferred if people had stayed. Um, but many of the gamers who are there to game for 24 hours, what they'll do is split up the time and we're perfectly cool with this. We don't require people to do 24 hours straight. It's not good for your health. So the auction tends to be the good breaking point for most people. Uh, plus those who aren't doing the marathon, it's getting late. It was nine, nine 30 at night at that point. So we lost a lot of people at that point, but it happens. First game I played after the auction was Jaws. Uh, this is another one from Ravensburger. Again, thank you for the review copy. Uh, Jaws is a one versus many board game similar to games like Letters from Whitechapel and Scotland Yard. Plays a max of four players with one player playing the shark. Game split over two phases, which, interestingly enough, kind of felt like playing two separate games. And how well you do in the first part directly influences the second. It was kind of an interesting game. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it was fun. I have to say, you know, I enjoyed that play. Um, it was very thematic. Uh, you're playing either the shark or the mayor, or the police chief, or the uh, the, um, the fisherman um, from the movie. Uh, you don't have to know the movie. No, there's no real yeah, need. I didn't. Yeah, Mo's, Mo's never seen the movie. You don't have to, uh, and it doesn't really help if you do, uh, other than in the thematic sense. Uh, you know, the the uh, you know some of the places on the board, the look of the ship make uh, make more sense. The barrels make a little bit more sense if you if you've seen the yeah. movie. Uh, but there's no need to have seen the movie. Uh, the problem for me is, uh, maybe it's because I'm not a big enough Jaws fan. I don't feel like I have any real interest in getting it back to the table. It was enjoyable. I enjoyed that one play, but unless I were to play the shark, just as to try something, the the one other, the one other way, way to play that game, um, I was done with it after that play. Fair enough. When we played it, so phase one, is the players trying to find the shark and attach two barrels to it, which someone had to explain what was going on there. You want to float <laughs> near the surface or whatever. And then the shark's trying to eat as many swimmers as possible. And this uses your whole Scotland Yard thing where someone's using a hidden green like a book and writing down where they're going and everyone's got to try to deduce where the shark is. The second phase, the shark's attacking the boat and the shark's trying to either eat the people or destroy the boat. And the people on the boat are trying to predict where the shark's going to pop up. That was basically the two different phases of the game. And, I thought it was interesting. Um, it definitely felt like playing two different games in a row, which was no, kind of cool. Uh, and, since Ryan's in the chat room, we should point out it didn't come with a pencil. No, it did not. <laughs> it did not. You had to write, <laughs> and it come didn't come with a pencil. With a pencil. Uh, I don't know. Like, uh, What's funny, uh, what I think unique about this game is I kept thinking if this was the 90s or the 80s, this would have been two separate games. You would have bought Jaws, Find the Shark, and you would have bought Jaws, Shark Attack. And they would have been, and people would have been happy with them as two yep. separate games. Yep. So I think the neatest part in this, like, takeaway for me is the way they mash these two together to do a campaign thing. I thought that was cool. Um, I got to play this more before I share more thoughts. I, I got to admit, it wasn't loud by it so far, but I've only tried the shark. I'll try the other way around. Yep. No, again, I, you know, I, I don't, again, it wasn't a bad game. Uh, it just, it was a one and done for me. I, I don't know. That happens. Yep. Now, right around when we were finishing up Jaws, uh, the huge Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Ziggurat finally got down to the final floor after 11 hours of play. I got to thank Dove for bringing that thing out. That got a lot of people's attention. Like I said, I know it at least got one person into the store just from people sharing so, pictures. That so was just, quite epic. Just to, for a quick description for those uh, people uh, listening, it was a giant Mayan stepped pyramid where the actual levels of the pyramid physically came off to reveal the floor within. Uh, there was a giant spiral staircase running down the center of the first several floors uh, with corner staircases on the ends. Uh, and he had actually installed LEDs into the walls to act as torches within mm-hmm. the ziggurat. I mean, this was really something to see. Yeah, it was impressive. Plus, as, as Deanna points out, the... Uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition, which is a system the three of us yep. grew up on, basically. So that Absolutely. was pretty awesome. Yep. I would have loved to have played that, but I couldn't have been tied up for 11 hours. Yeah, no, I that definitely wouldn't have worked. So yeah, at this point, it's getting late. I, I was feeling rough. 
every year the auction takes a lot out of me, and this year was no exception. Um, I swapped to light games at this point. It was time for silly party games and kids games. And man, this is when I broke out Rhino Hero. And wow, I have never had a game of Rhino Hero go over as well as this game did. Uh, Tori, who you all know from our Gloomhaven videos, Tori gets a little weird when he gets tired, a little punch drunk. And wow, he was he was enthralled he, he by Rhino Hero. He, he obsessed may be a good word. Um, this is a kid's dexterity game where you're building an apartment, building out of cardboard walls, basically building a house of cards. And your goal is to play all your floors and be the player or be the player with the least floors when the tower topples. And all I have to say is no one ever ran out of floors and we must have played 10 games. I don't have great dexterity to begin with. I drink a lot of coffee and I'm very shaky. <laughs> Why I decided to play Rhino Hero is beyond me. Because when you add on the amount of tired I was and the amount of coffee I'd been yeah. drinking all day, it was just a poor choice for me. Yeah, the, this game kept coming back out. Uh, it was a hit each time. There was a lot of laughter. Um, something about lack of sleep and lots of coffee. It, it, oh, man, Rhino Hero. Uh, uh, the hero we deserve, as Tori would say. Um, yeah. Rhino Hero was a thing. Uh, sticking with the dexterity theme, the next game I grabbed was something a little bit more thinking, and that's Hamster Roll. Uh, we talk about this a lot on the show, on the podcast, on the blog, for good reason. This is still one of the best dexterity games ever made. I love Hamster Roll. What was fun at the event, though, is we learned just how uneven the table was at the CG Realm. Wow. Uh, what was fun with that, though, is we made it so the wheel was going uphill, and it was interesting because, man, you had to pile a lot of blocks on that before it moved. But then when, when it did move, did it ever roll? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, uh, we played so much hamster roll. I don't even know how many rounds we played. Yeah, at least three. I know I know. I, I recorded three. I'm not sure if we, we did more uh, more than that or not. Yeah, I know personally, like the first couple rounds, I felt like I was a hamster roll master, like a dexterity game master to I just fell apart. And I was just my personal goal was collect every single piece. I, I think everyone loved hamster roll. That game always goes over well. Absolutely. So around this point, uh, the time change hit. This is one of the things that's uh, a highlight of our extra life every year, which actually I find a frustration. Glory eyed, we realized it was 1 a.m. again. Uh, at this point, I felt we needed something to kind of wake everyone up. So I went and grabbed my copy of But Wait, There's More. Um, I thought this would be good because it would be a game that gets everyone talking and everyone involved. Uh, this is a game where the players are giving a product you have to pitch. You combine that with a feature card in your hands, and you sell the product in infomercial style. The neat part is that partway through your pitch, you have to draw a card and say, But Wait, There's More, and add the new pitch to it. The new... Um, not pitch the new feature. feature new feature to your pitch after each round players are going to blind vote on whoever they think gave the best pitches it's a it's an improv almost rpg thing you're going to do three product tally provoke see who wins no absolutely it's it's fun i mean if you're not a if you're with a a group of people you're comfortable with and you can just let go and and just be feel free to improv uh it's it's absolutely enjoyable to just Come up with the craziest oh, yeah. things, and and you can you can plan the first half of your speech, but the second one is coming out of uh, the thin but air, I'd, so you'd rather better be in, in, yeah. In and it really could depth. be out of almost anything. I mean, the the, the possibilities are remarkable. Yeah, I, I I think it was a great way to wake everyone up, get everyone reinvigorated. Um, I haven't brought this game out in a long time, and man, I regret it. I got to start bringing this out to more public play events. I don't like a lot of party games in general, but this one I really like. We had a great time playing it Saturday night or Sunday morning. Yeah, Sunday morning. I, I had a lot of fun with it, but wait, there's more. I think that was the first time Sean had ever even seen that yeah, game. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. It, it is such a fun game. Yep. Uh, next was Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. As you can tell, we're sticking to the, the lighter stuff at this point. We were all tired and, yep. and cranky and everything that goes along with tired. Um, We've been playing Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters a lot, so that part was nice, that the rules were just really fresh in my mind. And just like I talked about last week, I said, next time I bring this game out with nine, with gamers, I'm skipping right to the advanced rules. That's what I did, and I'm glad I did. I, I love this game. Everyone who played it did it. Uh, you hadn't had a chance to try No, this was my first rules. time with the advanced rules. Uh, what do you think? 
And no, it's it's definitely fun. Um, and it's the 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 challenge is one of those. It's a co op that you're not going to beat most of the time. No, so it, you it, are it, not. It brings it to that gamer level where it's it's not a kids game you're going to beat if you if you do the right things. No, no, this is a gamer's game where you're probably going to lose even though it's co op. Yeah. I, and man, the frustration of those stupid doors. <laughs> <laughs> I love it though. I got to admit, I only played one round of Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters, but the group kept playing. I don't know if you played two, one more or two more. Uh, I only played one more. I think they might have played one in the middle. Okay, so yeah, there might have been three more games. So what I decided to do then is set up a racetrack, because I got to say, this is on a, pretty much an extra life tradition for me, is a 3 a.m. game of pitch car. Now, learning from the mistakes I made last time at our warm-up event where I decided to make a really difficult track, I made things pretty simple this time. Um, there were a couple jumps, but they were nice, basic, straightaway jumps. We played a five-player game, and I was happy because I got Ian to play. Now, Ian was there overnight staffing the store. Thank you very much, Ian, for staying overnight. But he doesn't get into a lot of games, and it was good to get him involved. Yeah, I, I think, love Pitch Car. And everyone everyone had a great time. I think uh, everyone kind of got sort of roped into playing, even though we were all tired. It was like, yeah. oh, I don't want to stand up. But then everyone stood up and wa stood around the table. And it was a nice tall table, which actually sort of helps you stay awake rather than leaning over or sitting down and, and flopping. Uh, and a good time was had by all, although I think that was kind of starting to uh, – wind down for the most of us uh yeah that this, this, this that might have been the, the killing blow energy, i think now i made things interesting we used one of the variant rules uh which are you know i forget what i think i called the death track rule but if you flick an opponent's car off the track they go where you started so that was fun actually i think i'm going to use that guard game from now on i mainly put that in because i thought it would encourage people to cheat and it worked for that so that was good um, now, while Tori may not be the best person to put a rhino meeple on a card tower, man, is he good at flicking crocodile-style cars around a track? He yep. kicked our butt. Yep. Um, at this point, I thought it was time for something heavy. No, actually, it was Cat made the decision and broke out Operation. Uh, Tori and Cat won a copy of this during the live auction. Uh, they bought it mainly to support the cause, right? They were just mainly donating money. But Tori had never played it, and he wanted to play it. And at this point in the morning, it seemed like the perfect game. Now, what shocked me is this is not the operation I played as a kid. The one I played was a game. This was more of an activity. When I played, you would flip up a bunch of cards equal to the number of players showing various ailments you had to cure. And they were worth different money depending on how difficult they were. And then you would try to do it. And if you failed, another person could be, no, I'm the specialist. They would volunteer. And if they succeeded, they got double the money. What that means is that there was some strategy and tactics. Like, for example, one of the tricks in the old game was to fail intentionally so you could try as the specialist and maybe get double money. All that's gone. There's no cards. You just pass the stupid thing around and try to make a pull, pull a bit out without it buzzing. If you do it, hey, you pass it to the next guy. Like, person. I, yep. I, I, I don't get it. Like, that, there's just... What's well, the and they even they even quieted down the buzzer, which is sort yes. of the, you know it used to be. I mean, when 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 we played the game as kids, if you touched the side, you jumped because oh, the yeah. thing screamed at you. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas at uh, in this one, you barely noticed there was a buzzer at all. You just had to look for the nose to light up. Yeah, you look for the nose. I no, I like I I feel bad for kids growing up with operation these days. Like that's not the operation I remember. Yep. Now at this point, I went out and uh, and started, well, at least trying to uh, to nap a little bit in the uh, in the van out back. Yeah. While Sean was napping, um, we stuck to some lighter, kid friendly games around here. Four or five a.m. I broke out King of the Dice from Haba. We've talked about this on the show. This is ages five plus. This went over pretty well. Uh, the interesting thing here is we had in the middle of the game a terrible spread of citizens partway through where every card in the tableau required six dice in certain patterns and none of them overlap. So basically you'd roll the dice once and pick which one you're going to go for and shot for the moon. That was interesting. So this game had a ton of scoundrels head into doubt. And we actually, the game ended because the scoundrels ran out, which has never happened before. I, this wasn't bad or good. It was just a thing. And I thought it was neat to see that this was a thing in King of the Dice I hadn't seen before. Yep. Next, I took out a card game called Dead Man's Draw. I have the Tabletop Day version of this that I won at one of the Geek and Sundry events a few years back. Uh, this is a really neat pusher luck card game um, that I really like, and I kind of forgot I had it. When I was packing for Extra Life, I was like, oh, wait, Dead Man's Draw. 
So here I was, I grabbed it, whatever time in the morning it was, and I threw it out. And I got to admit, the first half of the game was, whoa, wait, what's that do? As we looked up stuff in the rule book, there was an awful lot of, what's that do? Because there's 10 suits. So I think 10 times I had to go, wait, what's that do again? But I, I think we had a pretty good time. We were just playing four player, I think. Still a good game. Dead Man's Draw, I got to admit, I, 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 I need to bring that one back out. That was that was a neat game. Um, and then from there, we went on to the final game or games of the day, night, morning, whatever the heck it was. The sun was up. It was bright. I remember that much. My eyes were blurry. I broke out concept. We've talked about concept every time we talk about gateway games, party games, games to play at pubs, babes playing with babe groups. I love concept. This is my favorite big group party game it's a icon driven word guessing game um the big thing is just toss out the rules there are scoring rules you throw that out we play it as an activity one player draws a card tries to get everyone else to guess the concept then if that person whoever guesses the concept is the person who's going to give clues next time uh we had a whole crowd standing around we had people sitting down playing standing down playing this one drew a pretty good crowd early in the morning or as or as much as a crowd as it could in the uh the wee yeah. hours of the morning. Yeah, well, okay, big crowd compared to everything else <laughs> we played. Yep. Uh, at this point, it was probably around 8 a.m., which felt like 9 a.m. because of the time change. Deanna, thankfully, had shown up. She went home after doing a bunch of math and stuff after the auction and got some sleep. Uh, it was now time for me to tag team and let her take over while I got some sleep. So I'm going to pass this off to Sean because I don't even know what happened for the next little while. Uh, well, not unfortunately all that much. Uh, so uh, the War Machine tournament uh, was a failure to start. I mean, and I Ouch. felt so bad for Steve uh, that he didn't get that going. But, he had a bunch of prize support too. Like, yeah. So that was that was unfortunate. And uh, however, Solon, uh, X-Wing being what it is in Windsor, uh, had a great tournament that uh, he was all on top of. They did, They had a great time. Uh, but they're very self-involved, so we we felt we kind of backed off a little bit, and we weren't running uh, the draws and things during that because you don't want to interfere. It's a time yeah, tournament, a you tournament. know, time time levels, a real tournament. Um, they take their game very seriously, uh, as they have every right to, and uh, so we we let them uh, go through that, and they had a fantastic time playing X-wing. Uh, but unfortunately, that was pretty close to. Uh, what was going on, uh, except for, again, before before Kat and Tori finally tagged out, uh, Anshi Games played a few games with them. Uh, apparently, uh, Batman Love Letter was played again. I was still I was still doing the occasional nap out in the in the in my oh. van in the back. So yeah, I know Deanna pointed out it's a bunch of games she normally wouldn't play, but Tori and Kat were into the place to play anything that, that yep. Deanna might have wanted. And, to play. and we can't forget Jeff's uh, 4 a.m. DCC yes. game. Uh, where he ran a level two dungeon for level zero characters, I believe it was, uh, in order to encourage cheating, and uh, turned in quite the profit on the cheat That's jar cool. in order for them to stay alive. Uh, yeah, big thanks to Jeff and Sheila for showing up at 4 a.m. with savory foods in addition to uh, the sweets. That was a nice touch. That's something I called out on the blog, but probably worth mentioning here. Absolutely. And to whomever, we still don't know who, dropped off the spinach pastries. Thank yeah, you. Were they were fantastic. Yeah, that was nice. So I had a much needed nap. I got back around 3 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, at that point, the X-Wing tournament was still going on. They were in the, the, the very end of it. Solon was doing his thing. Uh, there was a huge game of, but wait, there's more going on in one corner. That Holy cow, was that loud. Uh, the overnight D&D game had wrapped up. Uh, I gotta say, unfortunately, the store was pretty empty. Um, I can't really complain because of how many people we had on Saturday. But Deanna and I were talking about this, and I think part of the problem was our flyer said November 2nd, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. November 3rd. And I think if those were on separate lines, it might have been better. I think people saw November 2nd, 10 till 6. And that's what got stuck in their head. Like, even Jeremy had 6 o'clock stuck in his head. Yep. Yeah, so the D and D game ended around eleven ish. So yeah, they they I'm sure they got their twenty four hours in and more yep. because of the time change. Yeah, no. But absolutely. like to be honest, Sunday was just regulars, except for someone's tournament. There wasn't anyone there to for extra life that I really saw, unfortunately. Yep. So that's something to to learn from next year. 
Uh, personally, I was good to go at this point, and I was hoping to show up and see a bunch of gamers. Uh, Jeff and Sheila were still there, so thankfully for that, they were up for playing a game. So I set up Veen Host Deluxe, excuse me, Veen Host Deluxe Edition. I ended up playing with Jeff and Sheila, as well as Chad. Uh, this, I think, I, I could be wrong here, but this is probably the heaviest game Jeff had ever played and Sheila had ever tried. So I did take a little longer with the teach than usual. I spent more time than usual explaining various terms and the effects of actions on top of just how they work. So it wasn't just the mechanics, more of the why. Um, I also added some tips I've learned from previous plays, like make sure you always have at least a buck on hand or you might be forced to pass. Um, I do feel bad for this, but in the middle of teaching main hosts, I did have to interrupt because we did have some gamers show up and they were fumbling around. They took a look at Cthulhu, which I wasn't going to take the time to teach that, but then they grabbed Dead Man's Draw. Uh, so I went back to Dead Man's Draw and taught them how to play and played a quick round for them. So thanks, Jeff, Sheila, and Chad for waiting while I took a break to play a game of Dead Man's Draw. Uh, Dead Man's Draw Awake was way better than Dead Man's Draw at 4 in the morning. Uh, yet again, that's a great pusher luck game. So if, you, if you're looking for a pusher luck card game, Dead Man's Draw is definitely up there. Then back to Venhos, uh, we did play five of the six rounds. And then we decided to pack the game up. Now, technically, the store was still open till 6. So they were open for another 45 minutes. But at that point, we were pretty much the only people in the store. And they'd already been open overnight for us. So I just wanted to be out of there on time. Um, the unfortunately short game of Venhos did go really well. Uh, Jeff's in the chat now confirming this. He seemed to be really loving it. Um, I think he's definitely digs the heavier games with this. Um, he noted in particular with Venhos, the theme was something he knew about and how that really helped to tie it in with the mechanics. And he liked how the mechanics and the theme integrated. He liked how it felt like every mechanic was there for a reason. And that reason could be tied to winemaking, right? So it just made, well, of course, your stuff ages and slides. And of course, having a seller would make the value go up and not the quality and all this other stuff. I thought that was really neat. Uh, by six o'clock, we had everything packed out and we were out the door. So 33.5 hours, I think, after we showed up Saturday morning and left with over $5,000 collected. Yeah. No, and I have to say, when it comes to Venos, while I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not the heavy gamer, the theme and the integration of the theme in Vinhos has actually sort of made me think, oh, if one of these times when we're actually when we actually have time to, you know, get the, yeah. the hours of play available that we don't usually ha necessarily have, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm I might be willing to sit down for that one. Yeah, I, of all the heavy games, that and food chain magnet, I, the the themes are just very accessible that way. Where food chain magnets though is really unforgiving. <laughs> that's the problem. Like food chain magnet, you're yeah. going to make some wrong decisions the first couple of turns and be out of the game. That's not going to happen in Vino. Right. Vinos is definitely a, a simpler teach than most. All right. Uh, so uh, look ahead. What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, it's, you know what? Uh, there should be a CG Realm event. I don't even know what we're doing for demos. I got to talk to Ian. It's already Wednesday. There's going to be an open gaming night Saturday, November 9th at CG Realm. I do know that our easy mode night on the 16th is going to be canceled. So I'm not sure what's going to be up with that. Um, I got a notice this morning. Again, I'm slightly under the weather, so I haven't caught up on all my emails. But I know easy mode has something else going on on the 16th. They've offered us the 17th to do a game night. I'm not sure if I'm free that Sunday to do it. So I don't know yet. Um, well, yeah, I know that's pretty much it. I, and I know we have some plays of uh, Horrified that we can uh, yeah, that we'll we be able to talk about talk as well. Next week we have more Minecraft and Horrified. More Minecraft, yep. So uh, I think we'll be able to give sort of a, a more complete review of both those games next week. Yeah, yeah Horrified Minecraft we'll be talking about next week. Um, I got a bunch of stuff unboxed I want to play. That's the other thing is I want to get people over to play some of that stuff I opened up. All right. He's going to pop into the lobby real quick. And again, since we're here and they're here, I'd like to say again, thank you, Jeff and Sheila, for all your help uh, throughout the weekend and tech. Thanks for stopping by. Um, yes, uh, Vinhos is harder than Eclipse. Uh, yeah. Eclipse is a three. Oh, well, Eclipse is a three, six, nine, while Vinos is a four or a four, uh, uh, I, four, I, I four or five. Games, I think that's a pretty big jump, actually. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, there really is a curve in the whole. It's not it's it's not a linear one to five. It's yeah. there's definitely a curve once you hit once you pass two. Yeah, it's two four point oh six for the Vino host we played. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Jeff did like it. So yeah, definitely the heaviest game he's played. 
Um, no, from Red Meeple Ryan, yeah, Concept would be probably the least uh, vision impaired friendly game I've ever played or owned. Yep. I don't think you could fix that one. Uh, and D mentioned she actually got in Lanterns and Azul as well. Oh, there's some good uh, games. During, yeah. Over the night. So I, I've never played Batman Love Lover. I probably shouldn't say anything bad about it. <laughs> Love Letter's not really my kind of game. No, what I'm, I, I kept thinking after the fact is why didn't we play? Like, well, how did we not break out Imhotep? With like Tori and Kat, who have played it a hundred times at three in the morning, I, I'm just surprised by some of the stuff that didn't get played when I started packing them up. Well, I think because we were stuck on the kids game yeah. concept, uh, we'd all sort of dropped into uh, youngin mode. I wonder. I, part of me was like, let's bring out Venus, and I wonder if that would have worked. Like, uh, if a not. brain burner might have worked people up, woke people up. Right. Uh, so, so Ryan's mentioning the Magic Maze and the Mind are less accessible. Oh, there you go. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. The mind. Did anyone play a card yet? Oh, you're not allowed to talk. Yeah, the yeah. mind would be. Okay, fair enough. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's got to be pretty close. Concept, Concept. all you're allowed to say is yes. Right. You could. I guess you could listen to what the other players are saying and guess things along the same line. If everyone's like, okay, it's a movie, and it, and it, has, it has a robot in it, you know, you could at least be playing part of it. <laughs> oh, that's it. We knew that Tori ah, would right. not be able to stop saying Imhotep. Right. That's probably true. Fair enough. All right. Well, thanks again to the lobby as we move on. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly from the excellent Gaming and BS podcast. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Mr. Acton Mark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering, although they are taking this month off. Oh, they're taking a month off. Eh? They are. They while well, they're doing, they're still doing their their That's live okay. plays. Well, they're doing their okay. live plays, but uh, they aren't doing the Tuesday night show. Interesting. I didn't know that. I got to listen to that last episode. I guess I got to shout out in one of them. So I got I got to try to find that one. And finally, thanks, Evil John. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're gonna have to lock the front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around. Join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.